Not yet, sir. Not yet. Now we are live, sir. Okay. Now, please, can you say something? Well, welcome to the interview. Uh, it's very, I'm very happy to be here, being interviewed by Sarah Banerjee. And uh, let's see what we can find out about Yeah, that. thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, my, my support will give me. Can you hear the sound? Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. So everything seems to be fine. Uh, okay. So we'll we'll begin now. Right. So uh, let me begin by welcoming all. Okay. Uh, very good morning or uh, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Yeah, and. Uh, Welcome to today's conversation titled Post-Colonialism, a Critique of the Present and Hope for the Future, Australia and the World, with Professor Bill Ascroft. We are indeed lucky to have with us Professor Ascroft. And let me begin by introducing our distinguished guest, though he needs no introduction in the world of academia. Bill Ascroft is an emeritus professor in the School of English, Media and Performing Arts at the University of New South Wales, Australia, he is a renowned critic and theorist and an expert of Australian literature, post-colonial literature and theory, Australian studies and cultural studies. He is the founding exponent of post-colonial theory, co-author of The Empire Rights Back, which is the first text to examine systematically the field of post-colonial studies. He is co-author and author of 21 books variously translated into five languages. He is also the author of over 200 books and ch book chapters and papers and on the editorial boards of 10 international journals. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And thanks for accepting my invitation to be here with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, so without much ado, let us begin. Yes. And. Uh, even at the risk of sounding cliche, I cannot avoid beginning my discussion about post-colonialism with you without a mention of the publication of the Empire Rights Back in 18, uh, 1989. That book, written over 30 years ago, is still relevant today. Uh, despite many people saying at the turn of the century that post-colonialism was over and that the term adaptation studies should replace it. Although it is true, uh, that the binary of the colonizers and the colonized uh, in absolute black and white terms, an idea that Edward Said subscribed to, has ceased to exist. Yet even now, imperialism exists in the new empires, the empire of idea, uh, the, of cultural power, of technological power, and perhaps above all, the empire of economic power, the powers by which the whole world is controlled or, and colonized to. Well, I want to ask you, how has post-colonialism adapted to these new imperialisms? Well, there's a saying, uh, Sram, that uh, we are after colonialism, but not without it. Uh, we still live in a world which is dominated by different forms of empire. Now, there's two things to remember. First, post-colonial theory is not a grand theory of everything. And secondly, post-colonial theory has developed strategies to help us understand the uh, nature of imperial power. And that power is not necessarily uh, located in the traditional uh, geographic power of uh, the British Empire. It's more increasingly um, located in the empire of neoliberal capitalism. But in as well as that, we have three territorial um, colonizers in the world today, that is China, uh, Indonesia, and Israel. Nevertheless, uh, the strategies of post-colonial theory are very, very useful in helping us to understand, firstly, the nature of imperial power, the way in which it works upon individuals, but more interestingly and more importantly, the uh, strategies open to people to resist and transform that power. Uh, this is something that uh, is very close to my heart, that resistance is not simply opposition, but it's a matter of uh, transformation 
and interpolation. Now, these things can be very, very useful in the continuation of um, uh, contemporary empires. And um, the, uh, the point being, of course, that uh, uh, colonialism is not over. It keeps transforming itself. It keeps uh, transforming its, its uh, strategies, its uh, nature, and its uh, uh, operations. So post-colonial theory continues to provide strategies to help us to understand, uh, A, the way in which imperial power works, and B, the ways in which the uh, dominated uh, might approach, transform, and resist that power. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this illustrative answer. And now moving on to the next question. You have defined post-colonial theory as that branch of contemporary theory that investigates and develops uh, propositions about culture and political impact of European conquests upon colonized societies and the nature of those societies' responses. And you have also said that three things that are part of this study are utopia and utopianism, borders and bordering, and transnation. Uh, would you please elaborate on these three? Well, those, uh, those concepts are ones that have whole books, I'm writing a whole book about each of them, so uh, it'll be quite a, quite a job to summarise it. Um, but those are not um, uh, aspects of post-colonial theory as we traditionally understand it. But what uh, they represent is the ways in which I am taking post-colonial theory. Now, firstly, utopia. Utopia is regarded in derogatory terms by most people as a fanciful, wishful thinking, a fantasy. And indeed, uh, Ernst Bloch, whose magisterial uh, principle of hope, really established uh, uh, utopian theory uh, in the Western world, is um, he says that utopias such as uh, Thomas More's are fantasies, but without hope, we cannot live. And so utopia and utopianism are about hope, they're about the belief that things can be different. Now, without that hope, without the belief that things can be different, resistance cannot work, it won't have any energy. And that uh, utopianism is the thing that I'm saying has driven um, uh, post-colonial transformation. Now, it's, it's also located in uh, cultural memory, and there's a number of aspects to this, but the, um, the principal thing to, rem to realise and remember is that this term that's regarded with such a derogatory, uh, in such a derogatory way, is in fact very important to understand the ways in which the dominated can uh, imagine a different world. And that's where literature, art and literature become very important the imagination of a different world. These are things that drive um, the, the creative spirit and drive us to uh, believe that things can be different. Now, boundaries are incredibly important in the world today. As we know, boundaries are crossed by refugees and asylum seekers, and nations have a hysterical response to this. There's the closing of borders, um, the borders uh, that are trying to prevent um, people fleeing to safety from uh, reaching that safety. And so borders have become incredibly important. And we know that in America, um, Donald Trump trying to put up a wall between America and Mexico who says, without borders, we don't have a nation. Now, I think uh, that's a very interesting uh, proposal. Borders do create a nation, and the nations do uh, rely on borders. They rely on borders to help uh, national citizens understand who is other. And this binary of self and other is incredibly important. But the theory of borders is much more interesting when we think of it as bordering practices. 
Now, one of these practices, of course, is putting a geographical border around the, the edge of the nation. But there are many more bordering practices that occur within the nation. Uh, bordering practices that are meant to control and to, um, uh, to funnel people into particular forms of uh, behaviour. And those, those uh, bordering practices are incredibly um, subtle and incredibly uh, significant in um, the, the carceral operation of the state, the way in which the state uh, controls its citizens. So that's where the principle of transnation comes in. We, we know about uh, transnational and uh, transnationalism is also a, uh, a theme within post-colonial studies. But uh, the transnation is the mobile nation that operates within and around the structure of the state. So the transnation may spread across geographical borders, but more often circulates around the bordering practices of the state. Now, the transnation is incredibly threatening to the state because the state wants to uh, control the, um, the subjects it has in its power. And that's why you get to, today the increase in uh, security and the, um, the, the phrase, you know, a danger to security. Uh, uh, whenever the, the state feels that its uh, citizens are getting out of its control, even in the most minor ways, it, uh, it produces this idea of, um, uh, of national security. And, of course, this uh, idea of national security, uh, in a sense, justifies its um, bordering practices within the state. So these, this idea of borders, bordering practices, and the transnation that circulates around the bordering practices of the state, these, these go hand in hand. And, of course, they are natural uh, extensions of post-colonial studies because they're talking about the ways in which uh, power uh, tries to control individual subjects. And those subjects um, have been in the subject of uh, post-colonial studies have been uh, colonised subjects, but we see that in an interesting way, uh, the citizens of the nation, the subjects of the state, are also in many real ways subjects of colonial power. And so that's why post-colonial studies continues to be useful in, um, in addressing the, the operations of power in the temporary state. Okay, that's very nicely explained. And, and now coming to the Australian context, uh, there are two contradictory views about Australian literature being post-colonial literature. And this, despite the fact that uh, three of the founding, I mean, people of post-colonialism, yourself, Gareth Griffiths and Helen Tiffin all belong to us, all stay in Australia, and such. Rather. So on the one hand, we have people like Nathaniel O'Reilly, who feels Australian literary study is marginalized within postcolonial studies. And the postcolonial theorist Robert J.C. Young has gone on to define postcolonialism in such a manner that it excludes settler colonies altogether and focuses exclusively on African, Caribbean, or South Asian literature. And on the other hand, uh, this uh, the other part of the spectrum, the other end of the spectrum, we have people like Gayatri Chakravarti Srivet who acknowledges that Australia is part of the post-colonial world. So what are your views on this debate about Australian literature being post-colonial literature or not? Well, settler colonies are a very interesting case because they are both colonised and colonising because they colonise Indigenous people, but they are also very aware of their own subject uh, as, as being colonised by imperial power. So they're in a very uh, um, ambivalent situation. The, um, the thing that we need to understand is that post-colonial is not a way of being. It's not ontological, you know. Post-colonial is a way of reading. 
And we can read the uh, literatures of settler colonies in post-colonial ways. We Obviously, we can read the literatures of Indigenous people in post-colonial terms, but also we can read the, um, the writings, the nationalist writings of settler colonies in their resistance to imperial power. In Australia's case, this resistance was always itself very ambiguous because you could be a nationalist and at the same time an empire loyalist. So uh, Australia, perhaps even more than other settler colonies such as Canada, uh, is in particularly ambivalent situation because it's uh, torn between a, a desire uh, to establish a nation uh, and that break away from, from uh, the British Empire, but also a loyalty to that empire. At the same time, it continues the uh, colonizers um, activity of uh, oppressing the indigenous people, of disinheriting them from their land. So um, Australian literature, Australian creative work is very, very, uh, amenable to being read in post-colonial terms. It doesn't mean um, that we can say it is post-colonial because what I suggest is that uh, post-colonial isn't a way of being. It's a way of reading. And we can read both the, the white uh, inheritors of the convict system and the, uh, the indigenous people of, that have been disinherited by uh, by occupation. We can read this in, in post-colonial terms. So absolutely, uh, settler colonies are part of the post-colonial uh, subject matter, if you like. Part of the post-colonial world. Okay, so uh, continuing with this answer, actually, so uh, the next question is a little uh, naughty question, if, you, if I may say so. Uh, you have said time and again, but it has been seen in history that all achieved utopias have become dystopias. But uh, in the case of Australia, hasn't the reverse happened? So what I'm trying to say is that as a land of oddities, it was conceived of as a penal colony and a perfect dumping ground for the scum of the British society. Mm. So much so that after convict transportation to Australia became a reality from 1788 onwards, it was summed up by the image of the Botany Bay and Lord Stanley's declaration in 1833 that he would actually make transportation worse than death. Now, despite all these, Australia has now become the destination to be in. Mm -hmm. So what are your views on this? Well, this is a very generous uh, uh, summation of Australia's position in the world. Um, uh, I'm not sure that uh, most Australian academics would agree that Australia is a utopia. Uh, but uh, it has certainly begun as a very pronounced dystopia. There's something we need to understand about not only Australia, but about America too. Now we think of, uh, we think of Australia as being founded on genocide, the uh, dispossession of the indigenous people but it's also founded on slavery. The enslavement of convicts, not to the extent that slavery uh, characterized American society, but I want to suggest that um, slavery, as much as genocide, characterizes the DNA of both America and Australia. And this has particular effects on the way in which the country treats those people who are poor, disinherited, indigenous, non-white, and it, uh, it leads to a situation where for anybody but middle-aged white males like myself, Australia is definitely not a utopia. However, it is still the, um, the, the destination of many people fleeing uh, 
fleeing uh, persecution. And to some extent, it has it it is a fortunate country in that it has a large uh, number of um, resources which it uh, sells to the world. It has a small population, so it's relatively a rich country. But you know, that's very different from saying that it is a utopia. It may be a utopia for the rich and for the white, but it's not a utopia for everybody. And we need to understand why that's the case. And I say it's because Australia is grounded in its dystopian origins. It has never shaken those off, not just um, genocide or just genocide. I mean, but convictism, if you look carefully at the way in which convictism worked, it was the deportation of slaves to Australia to help establish um, the, um, the country in the benefit of the rich. And in the beginning of Australia's uh, settlement, the rich were members of the military who uh, grabbed large parcels of land for themselves, used col uh, convicts as slaves to, um, to work that land, and that, uh, I would say, has characterised Australian society ever since. Um, now, that's not to say that uh, Australia is, is beyond hope. And there is still a, a great deal of, um, uh, of self-reflection by, by people who uh, understand the, the nature of genocide. But I say this as well. Um, and it may come up in another question. But when we think of love of nation, nationalism, nativism, these things are founded in racism. And that's true for countries all over the world. And so this is something we need to understand about the, the rise of nativism, populism, and uh, uh, nationalism in the world today. So Australia, as a settler colony, is tremendously ambivalent. It has a very troubled uh, history and past. It's birthed in, um, in, in dystopia, uh, and it has developed um, wealth for many of its, uh, of, of its citizens. But it is still a country that bears reading in a post-colonial way. It's uh, a country that's colonised and coloniser. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, again, continue, uh, continuing with the Australian context from the perspective of borders and bordering, Australia being an island didn't have too much of a concern about its external borders, I suppose. But the question of inside borders was a different issue. As you said, the white European settlers had created a border around themselves, inside which they did not allow the entry of the indigenous Australians, the Asian immigrants, and even the darker skinned Europeans. Now, uh, can we say that they were not trying to impose their culture on the others, but uh, simply trying to protect their own racial and cultural superiority? Would we be right to assume that? What do you feel, sir? It really um, depends on who you regard as others. I would say that both of those things are true. It uh, was protecting white privilege, but also where Indigenous people were concerned. Um, the stolen generations of children who are born to, say, black mothers and white fathers, were stolen uh, and taken to put in into missions and schools for the specific reason of inculcating those children with uh, white so-called civilised values, which were far from civilised. And so um, the, um, the, the white society where Indigenous 
children were concerned, were very definitely trying to inculcate in them what they saw as uh, civilised values. Um, but when it comes to people trying to cross the border, of course, then uh, Australian politicians definitely want to resist that and maintain what they see as the Australian way of life, whatever that is. And so, yeah, these two things uh, operate. There are bordering practices operating all the time within a state. And that uh, those bordering practices operate within Australia in a way that we can say colonises the dispossessed, colonises the poor, colonises the non-white. And so these things are, these are matters of very great concern to, uh, to many uh, intellectuals in, in Australia today. We do have what it, what's been ironically called a lucky country because we have a, a huge number of, um, of, of resources, but by the same token, we are a country that has become complacent. And we are a country that has taken its uh, political uh, cues, unfortunately, from the partisanship of the US. So there's a number of issues uh, that operate there. Um, but in, in, to sum it up, though, uh, Australia both wants to encourage others, such as Indigenous people, to adopt the white uh, Australian way of life and on the other hand to protect that way of life from people who they regard as others people who are trying to cross the borders so those bordering practices are both around the state and through it and within it and uh, that um, that becomes something that i would say um kind of pollutes the spirit of a country now I'm, I'm sounding uh, pretty pessimistic here, uh, but what I um, would say is that the, the criticism of the, um, of the state that goes on in Australia is carried out by people who really believe in, in the nation, people who uh, love the country and want it to be open and embracing to all comers. It is... Um, the most multicultural society in the world and that is a positive but the term multicultural unfortunately puts white society at the center and other cultures circulate around it what we want to see is a culture that's uh, multi-ethnic and uh, very very happy with uh, with being that so it has the potential to be a country that is embracing of outsiders, of uh, embracing of its others, and it just needs people with vision to put that potential into practice. Okay. And uh, I found that uh, in uh, many of your lectures, you have talked about the. Uh, Waiting for the Barbarians by the South African writer J.M. Kudzi in trying to show how the Barbarians, the outsiders, so as to say, uh, create the sense of the insiders. And here I can cite uh, the example of the Australian novelist David Manu's novel, Remembering Babylon, where a group of Scottish settlers in tropical New Queensland of the mid 19th century are shown always living in fear of the Aborigines across the fence, the border. Mm. They are unable to accept and assimilate the black white man, Jenny Fairley, who comes into their society from across the border. Yeah. And despite him being a, a European, because he had lived with the Aborigines for 16 years, and also perhaps more importantly, because he has lost his language. So now I want to ask you, how important does language become as a tool in post-colonial theory? I am thinking in terms of the idea of language transformation, the idea of transformation as a form of othering and offering resistance. Wow. You could just... Uh, 
Well, it's a multi-layered question. So I'm sorry. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, waiting for the barbarians. Now, Kavafi's yep. uh, poem was very interesting because it says uh, the barbarians are not there. They've gone. Mm -hmm. And there's a fascinating line, what will we do without the barbarians? You know, how can life continue without the others? How can it continue without uh, understanding who we are not? I think this principle is absolutely fundamental to, to borders, to the idea of nations. But uh, in the early settlers uh, that uh, David Malouf talks about, it's very interesting because what happens, firstly, we have to look at the border as a fence, right? Now, the fence that uh, you put around your property has an important function. It establishes that piece of land as property. It establishes it as yours. But at the same token, it establishes a difference between what's inside and what's outside. So what Malouf is doing is showing a very practical historical example of a border, that is a fence, which establishes private property, which is the fundamental principle of a Western agriculture, and he shows it as a symbolic barrier between the settlers and those people who are present in what is called the absolute dark. The absolute dark is the place of the indigenous people. Now, Jimmy Fairley is a person who is, uh, falls off a ship and is brought up. He's white, but he's brought up by Aboriginal people. So, in a sense, what he represents, and this is so true of so many things in uh, David Malouf's writing, what he presents is a possibility of a different kind of future, a future uh, where hy the hybrid person is not um, rejected, a person where cultures can meld. And this, uh, this possibility is not even considered by um, the administrators of the colony at the time. But the fence becomes very important because it establishes the other, even when that other is not quite other, because that other is a white boy brought up with the Aborigines. And one of the, um, one of the people asked himself, is it possible we could have a white Aborigine? And the, the whole idea of hybridity confuses them. Now, hybridity is a term that I use in terms of cultural intermixing, not so much biological intermixing. And it's extremely important in terms of uh, cultural advancement. Now, when you talk about language, uh, well, I've written a book on this as well. Uh, language is incredibly important in, um, in, in uh, post-colonial terms. Um, Jemmy fairly loses his language um, and it becomes absolutely crucial. And let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning. The origins of post-colonialism actually occur in Lord Macaulay's minute to Parliament, where he says that uh, we need to educate Indian intellectuals, Indian, um, you know, ruling class, and we must do it by with English, because it's the greatest language in the history of the world. What he didn't realise, what the administrators didn't realise, was that. The colonial, the colonised people would take that language, transform it to make it work for themselves as a uh, form of self-representation. And not only uh, did that language become transformed, but it was enabled uh, post-colonial people to interpolate the, the discourse of English literature. So in particular with India, the... Um, interpolation of English literature by uh, Indian uh, works, novels and poetry transformed the discourse of English itself. And this is something that the administrators could never have uh, predicted. They thought yes. if we teach 
people English, well, we can make a, a whole generation of mimic men. But as Hami Baba says, there is menace in mimicry. And what the mimicry led to was a transformation, a transformation that uh, the, um, the, the colonizers had no answer for. The transformation is what led to uh, independence in 1947. And of course, independence in uh, other colonies through the 50s and 60s. Now, um, language, I think, is absolutely crucial. And I suggest if people can get hold of Caliban's voice, they'll see why it is crucial, because language is the key to so many transformations that uh, uh, are carried out by the colonised. The not only language is transformed, but modernity itself is transformed. A whole range of things are uh, transformed, and language is the the key to it. Language is the the model, if you like, for the way in which the um, post-colonial society works. So, yeah, I think language is is crucial, um, and when Jimmy uh, tries to um, Formulate English words, it's very interesting because this formulation of English is incredibly threatening to uh, to the settlers. You really can't understand um, how we could have somebody on the other side of the fence who can actually speak our language. So, yeah. So, you know, yeah. you've been on uh, David Malouf would know all this, but... <laughs> yeah, no, so uh, I'd like to point out something like uh, this Jimmy Fairley, he doesn't have a language, but this Jimmy Fairley uh, was modeled on a person who had actually been lost to the Aborigines and he came back and he did not lose his language. Right. And Malouf in one of his interviews had actually confessed that he purposely gave no language to Jimmy because he wanted to see what the settlers would make of him when he cannot speak. Right. Uh, I'd like to point out one more thing is that the call as minutes that you said and the exact words that we use perhaps are that if the English language uh, has done good for the Tatars, I don't see why it should not do good for the Hindus. That is referring to the Indians as Hindus. Yeah. And uh, whatever the Indian English has become today is not because of the efforts of the British government to educate us, but despite their efforts. They yeah. wanted to create pretty clerks out of it. And like Caliban, our profit on the language that they taught us is that we can curse them in our language, if I may say so. Right. Well, you're so, talking, uh, talking like Caliban there. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, much more important, the cursing is uh, transforming. And um, yes, I'm yes, yes. Here, I am a, a, a British object, not a, rather than a British yes. subject. Which is that is what he has said. Don't don't shoot. I am a British object. Yes, yes. Which is actually very very profound. Uh, in, in a sense, he wasn't a, a British a subject of the British Empire, uh, but yes. An object. And uh, I think you know, in his usual way, um, Maluf is very very subtle in the way he um, he handles these things, particularly handling language. But, uh, Yes. So, uh, moving on, my next question is that uh, coming to the concept of the transnational, uh, isn't it quite intriguing that people like Salman Rushdie, who has lived mostly in the UK and New York, and Peter Carey, who has been living in New York for the last decade, are still considered Indian and Australian writers, respectively? So why is it so? And the second part of this question is whether you consider the transnationals as potential threats to the culture and organizing principles by which the state organizes its people. Yeah. Okay, the first part of your question is uh, there are different reasons why um, people are considered to be um, writers from the country of their birth. Uh, now, in, in um, Salman Rushdie's case, I think the impact that he made in the world of letters was very much focused on uh, works such as uh, Midnight's Children and uh, works that we could put in in the genre of the Bombay novel, you know. So 
even though his writing went far afield and um, uh, talked about all kinds of things, even from uh, satanic verses on, uh, he is uh, justified in being regarded as an Indian writer because of the um, origin of his uh, of his works and the real the power of things such as Midnight's Children. Uh, and um, in Carey's case, Carey, although he lives in, in uh, New York, continues to write about Australia and continues not only to write about Australia, but to write about uh, Australia's relationship with the contemporary empire of the United States. If, if we um, look at uh, novels such as Tristan Smith um, and even Amnesia, um, Carey is still very much concerned with um, the operation of power in Australia, upon Australia, uh, Australian subjects. So, so there's two different reasons why they are regarded as um, either India and Australia. Um, now, you said uh, are transnationals potential threats to the culture and organising principles? Well, as we said in, in you know, our discussion so far, transnational people across borders are regarded as outsiders. In terms of uh, waiting for the barbarians, for instance, outsiders are useful in helping us understand who we are not. So when they cross the borders, they confuse our sense of who we are not. And they begin to show us that uh, as, as a nation, we are very different from that entity that's controlled and uh, formulated by the state because the nation is a multi-ethnic, um, complex, uh, seething hybrid of uh, inter interconnected um, and, and, and transnational people. Um, but more than transnational, I think that the transnation the people who circulate around the, the structures of the state uh, are, the, are the thing, they're, they're, the, they're the subjects who uh, are really scared the, uh, the, 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 the state power they, because they seem to be hard to control. So in that respect, um, people who, who exist outside the binary that uh, is set up by state power, these people do offer a threat to that control because they offer a threat to the borders and bordering practices of the state. Uh, and, and do you also consider these uh, transnationalist tendencies to be elitist tendencies because it is not possible for everyone to become a transnational? No, that's right. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, not very fond of the term uh, cosmopolitan because you know, cosmopolitan is fine for a person who can move uh, mm -hmm. between countries at will, but there's, uh, that's actually a very small proportion of, uh, of the world population. And the, um, you know, would you call a refugee or asylum seeker transnational? Probably, well, it, uh, it, 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 they're certainly not what we regard as cosmopolitan, are they? And that's why I'm, I'm a bit suspicious of these uh, these terms such as cosmopolitan, even the term diaspora, because it assumes that a person is separated and constantly nostalgically looking backwards towards home. Uh, what I think uh, we we should be looking towards is a different way in which people interact. Uh, they can interact in terms of their own cultural memory, in terms of their present, in terms of their hope for the future, their vision of a different possibility. So, uh, so yes, I think that uh, what uh, what what we need to do is move away from words such as cosmopolitan and even transnational, and towards a, a sense of a different kind of nation that we can call a transnational a nation that's uh, a complex interconnectedness of cultural memory and cultural futures. Right. And uh, 
in one of your uh, chapters book chapters titled beyond the nation australian literature as world literature uh, you have referred to bei dao who is perhaps the best known chinese poet outside china and discussed how he earns his identification with the nation by dissidence and exile rather than by nationalism so well, here i am reminded of another of david manu's characters ovid from his novel an imaginary life mm. this imaginary poet too creates his identity by dissidence and is exiled because of that taking this as a representation of australian cultural nationalism can australian writer be seen as a dissent and an attempt to create an identity as distinct from that of britain yes well that's um, you again you brought in a question with multi layers <laughs> So first, yeah, Bader. Bader is interesting because uh, he's a dissident poet, and he's a uh, because he's such an abstract poet. He's a hard poet for the state to uh, to control. And um, I I saw him in post-colonial terms because China is an empire uh, parading as a state, as a nation. It's fifty uh, two ethnicities. Some of which, as in uh, the Uyghurs, are desperately um, disenfranchised and def and actually imprisoned. So uh, I say Baidao as a very interesting case of uh, anti-imperial uh, poetry, and successful because he was so abstract that the the state uh, authorities could couldn't control it. Now. In terms of uh, imaginary life, uh, you know, a, a terrific uh, novel that's about it really explores the the point of contact of of different of different cultures, the the point of the emergence of language, and the um, the the ways in which um, difference can be. Uh, harnessed as as, a, as a, an, a form of empowerment. Um, so Australian writing um, has been a form of, uh, of of nationalism. Yeah, I mean we had a nationalist period uh, in the 1890s through to the 1920s, and then revived again in the uh, 1950s. But uh, at the same time, the, um, the the nationalism of the writing went hand in hand with a kind of uh, with what we call empire loyalism. People could still be, um, uh, if you take for example, the eighteen nineties. You know, there's a tremendous period of nationalism when um, politicians and uh, and writers were working towards the um, uh, the 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 um the great moment of federation in 1901, but at the same time, uh, the energy of that uh, sense of uh, national character was also uh, something that provided the energy for their entry into the First World War to support uh, uh, to support Britain. Uh, it's a, you know, an endlessly ambiguous kind of uh, situation Australia is in. But there's two things you can say about this. There is a, a quite obvious uh, nationalism in Australian writers uh, for a period. There's an increasing nationalism of a particularly subtle kind growing in Australian writing that sees the... Um, intersection of different cultures, the intersection of uh, women and men, of black and white, as a, as a form of a different kind of nation. So that old nationalist writing which saw Australia as something special, as a kind of utopia, you know, that's when the idea of Australia as a utopia really took hold, that's become uh, modified and in subtle ways matured into 
a different uh, view of Australia. Australia as a multi-ethnic and uh, interwoven complex of, of cultures. It has the basis for this uh, officially in its uh, role as a multicultural nation, um, the most multicultural nation in the world, but it, it really requires a different form of nation to, to take those aspects, those, that multi-ethnic aspect and, and um, use it for uh, the generation of a different kind of nation. So, yeah, I think that uh, what's, what's happening is um, different forms of nationalism are operating. There's a form of nationalism which is jingoistic and nativist, but there's a form of nationalism which sees the potential of a different kind of nation, a different kind of society. And I think that is the way in which uh, Australian literature is moving. So we read that, we read that in post-colonial terms, you know, that it is a way in which the, um, the, the idea of Australia is being transformed. So the new nationalism that you're talking about, uh, propagated by the new writers, I mean, can it be called uh, cultural nationalism? And uh, is it undercutting state authority? What do you think? Well, it's a, that's a very interesting question because the transnation, it potentially undercuts state authority. Even when people uh, abide by the state's authority, the, the fact that they have the potential to move around the structures of the state is itself very threatening to the state. Um, and I think that um, this, uh, this, is, this is something that all states, if you like, are, are, are threatened by. But, uh, but Australia's um, creative um, artists have the capacity to see a different kind of Australia. Now that that's very interesting because the present government, which is a conservative government, sees creative works, created the creative industry and universities as its enemies. Yes. That's why they didn't give a, those people job keeper, you know, to support them through the pandemic. Uh, along with the ABC. So this, uh, this, this government is very clear about who its enemies are. And I think it's very promising that its enemies are creative industries and the intellectuals, because these are the people who are formulating a different kind of nation who have the picture of a future, a different kind of future. This is where utopianism really hits the ground. It's uh, the view of possibility, a country that is multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicolour. And uh, another important aspect that Australian literature, uh, Australia, sorry, is affected by as a settler colony nation is what Arthur Phillips calls the cultural cringe. So what is the contextual history of the cultural politics centered on Arthur Phillips's notion of the cultural cringe, cringe and its yeah. inverse aggressive nationalism. Well, now that's uh, that is a good question. Those, these two forms are united. Now, the cultural cringe is the idea that we are just a colony. Well, it comes from the idea that we're just a colony, and therefore anything that occurs overseas is better. That leads to our in the 1950s and 60s, our writers and artists going to London because that's where real life occurred. So the cultural cringe was simply the idea that if it was Australian, it was second rate. And if it was uh, not uh, from either Britain or America, but in the, the mid 20th century, particularly Britain, if it wasn't from Britain, it really didn't count. So the interesting thing, how does that connect to 
radical nationalism, it's because the reaction to that cultural cringe was an equally, um, um, well, active and emotional and um, I, I'd say the, the, the radical nationalism that emerged is in some curious and subtle ways a mirror image of the cultural cringe because it recognised that uh, Australia needed something radical, something uh, desperately radical to overcome uh, the idea that it was second rate. So it, uh, it, it wanted to establish itself as, in a sense, the centre of the world. So the, um, the cultural cringe whereby Australians believe anything Australian was second rate uh, came to be, um, um, well, it, in a sense, it came to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, opposed, um, violently opposed by, um, by, by radical nationalism. So in, in an interesting way, these two things form a, a kind of mirror image of each other. Uh, and um, they, neither of them can accommodate the idea of a multi-ethnic complex interweaving um, national culture, which, uh, which is what Australia is, I believe, becoming. Thank you so much for this answer. And uh, you have referred to the Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch, uh, a little earlier, and uh, in his book, the, uh, the Principles of Hope, he has said that imagining the future is fundamental to human life. Do you think that post-colonial theory has the strategies to rekindle the hope for the imagined future, despite the repeated failures of utopias in history? In the sense of post-colonial theory is uh, one that um, privileges a, an imagination of a different future. It's definitely very uh, relevant and useful for understanding the potential of um, national life. Yes, I think the post-colonial theory, in as much as it takes the imagination of a different kind of future and, and, and sees it as a way in which we can uh, uh, transform our relationship with power, I think it definitely has a... Um, uh, an important role to play. To play. Uh, I um, I would think that um, the, the the critical thing to remember is that uh, utopia, while many people think of it as a vain uh, fantasy, wish fulfillment, utopianism is a key to imagining a different kind of future, and that uh, is extremely important in. Um, driving towards that future because nothing is achieved unless it is first imagined. Right. Thank you, sir. And uh, finally, uh, any words of advice to the young students who wish to take up the study of post colonial theory or perhaps any other thing that you wanted to say but have remained outside the scope of my questions? Uh, Look, um, what I would say is that um, remember that this is a field that is a vibrant, convivial democracy, that there are a lot, uh, a lot of uh, different views operating within post-colonial theory, uh, a lot of views that uh, question the very idea of post-colonialism. Don't, um, don't be misled by that. The, 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 the real strength of post-colonial theory is its capacity to generate different forms of analysis and even to embrace those, uh, those theories or those people who uh, critique it. And so it's an, an incredibly uh, embracing and convivial in that sense. I use that sense of living together, many different forms of analysis living together. So um, when you go into uh, 
you know, studying post-colonial theory, just remember that your own ideas are acceptable and your own ideas are a valid and valuable way of pushing the field ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we have, we have come to the end of a very fruitful session. And I'm sure our listeners have been greatly benefited by your wisdom. Right, thank you. I thank you once again, sir. Right, thanks and call much. it a day here. So okay. call it a day here. Okay. Bye. Till we meet again. Okay. Well, uh, I'll leave now. And thanks very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.